All right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I hope you're all well, despite uh, events uh, swirling around us. Um, I'm delighted to be here uh, with all of you and with our guests uh, for a discussion that should have been face to face, and we regret it not being face to face, but there are also some advantages uh, to having it be online, and hopefully we have a um, international audience uh, that, that can participate without actually having to show up physically at uh, Tel Aviv University, so we'll, we'll make um, lemonade. And, um, and, and enjoy this afternoon uh, because there is much to enjoy. So um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, this is a particularly ripe moment uh, for the discussion we are going to have today since the past year has been, um, I think uh, in many ways, a turning point in the US-Israel relationship. The May war introduced a new tone in the public discourse on Israel in the United States, which was visible to anyone following closely, American media, uh, both old and new. So I want to start by uh, a quote from Peter Beinart, uh, the uh, Jewish American journalist, in a recent posting uh, to just uh, frame the discussion uh, in, in, uh, in, in some ways. So Beinart says, for my entire adult lifetime, the mainstream American conversation about Israel-Palestine the one you watch on cable television and read on the opinion pages has been a conversation among political Zionists. Its participants have argued over how the Jewish state should behave, not whether it should exist. Last year, that began to change. Palestinians entered America's public discussion in an unprecedented way, and with their entrance, anti-Zionism entered too. In 2021, the terms of US discourse began to shift. The ramifications of that shift will likely be with us for decades to come. Today, we are going to be delving into this subject with some of the leading experts on the Israel-US relationship who have either published or will be publishing new work in this field. While the books we will be discussing are histories of the US-Israel relationship in the realm of mostly high politics and diplomacy, it seems to me that the shifts Beinart is referring to here in culture and public opinion provide an inescapable backdrop for a discussion about the present and future of this relationship. And so with this in mind, uh, let me introduce our first two speakers and the format as you saw in the invitation will be a, an author of a book uh, discussing his book, and it is only his, um, in, in this uh, event today. Um, and then a respondent uh, who will discuss this book and also frame the questions um, uh, which we're interested in uh, by referring, of course, uh, to their own work, which is highly relevant. So our first speaker is David Tal, who is the Yossi Har-El Chair in Modern Israel Studies at the University of Sussex and has been there since 2013. Before that, he was the Kahanov Chair in Modern Israel Studies at the University of Calgary, Canada. He has authored five books, edited two, and published more than 40 articles dealing with Israel's military and diplomatic history and US nuclear disarmament policy. His most recent book, which we will be discussing today, is The Making of an Alliance, The Origins and Development of the US-Israel Relationship. And according to Amazon, the book can be purchased starting today, January 6th. This is publication day. And uh, congratulations, David. It's always somewhat exciting, right, when that happens. Um, responding to David uh, will be Avraham Bensvi. Avi Bensvi is a full professor of international relations at the University of Haifa in Israel and the head of the program in diplomacy studies and the dual degree program with the University of Warsaw in international relations. He is um, the winner of the Israel Prize in po Political Science and International Relations for 2020, an event which we celebrated here on a previous occasion. Avi received his PhD from the University of Chicago and spent most of his academic career in the Department of Political Science at Tel Aviv University. He has published 12 books and numerous articles and monographs 
most of which with a special focus on the origins, evolution, and dynamics of the American-Israeli partnership. His new book, which is jointly written with doc Dr. Gadi Varshav, is entitled Israel's Foreign Policy from 1948 to 2018, Selected Issues. It's in press now, it's scheduled to be published next year, and uh, surely it is relevant to the discussion that we'll be having here. So David, I'm handing it over to you. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you very much, Yoav, for setting up the whole event. Uh, it's really a pity that we uh, are not sitting now somewhere at Tel Aviv University, but we will do uh, the best uh, under these circumstances. And I would like to uh, discuss, to start my uh, discussion, with uh, two stories. Uh, one is for uh, raising two historical events. One was uh, happened in 1917 when uh, Britain was uh, contemplating the issuance of a declaration that we will become to be known as the Balfour Declaration. And uh, during the process of discussions, the British uh, turned to President Woodrow Wilson asking uh, for his endorsement and support for the declaration. And Wilson uh, uh, endorsed the declaration and he did so despite the very strong objection of his Secretary of State, members of the Department of State, and diplomats throughout the Middle East, and missionaries also spread across the Middle East. And the question is, of course, why did Wilson do that? Why did he endorse a resolution that seems to go against British, uh, uh, American interests? So that is one historical event. The second historical event happened in uh, May 12 May 1948, when President uh, Truman uh, was contemplating uh, granting de facto recognition to the new state of Israel that was about to be established three days ahead. And his discussant or opponent was Secretary of State George C. Marshall, one of the most distinguished and respectable figures in American uh, uh, diplomacy and history. And uh, uh, Marshall, along with the Department of State, strongly objected granting such a recognition to the state of Israel. And during the debate over that issue, Marshall said, if there were elections today, I wouldn't vote for you, Mr. President. And that was May 1948. Elections were due in November 1948. And despite the strong objection of his Secretary of State, a person that Truman had great respect for, Truman decided to acknowledge, to uh, grant Israel the recognition, which he granted about 11 minutes after the establishment of the State of Israel. So once again, we have an example of a president going against what seems to be American interests. So why did he do that? And I'm going back to 1948 and before that to 1917, because I think that the main crux of my book essentially, which is that ideas played a significant role in the making of American policy toward Israel, we can see that in a clearer light when we go back a time when, at least ostensibly some of the factors that later on would become part of the decision-making uh, of the American foreign policy did not exist during those years. So my argument in the book is that ideals, which I, in a minute, I will uh, uh, explore some of them, were more dominant than interests in the conduct of the American policy toward Israel. And in order to show the power you started, Yael, with mentioning the fact that there are talks about a shift that is about to happen since 1921, maybe before that, maybe after that. But I, the book covers the years 1917 and even a little bit earlier up to the beginning of the 21st century. And that is because I wanted to show how the line of continuity was much stronger than the line of change. And that line of continuity was based on what I call constants, which determined the course of American policy toward Israel. And these constants were three. It was religion, 
shared values, and history. And I would like to explore a bit what do I mean by these three. So to start with religion, there were three currents within American Protestantism that out of religious uh, beliefs supported the idea of a Jewish state and the state of Israel after the establishment of the state of Israel. The first were known as the dispensational premillennialists. The dispensational premillennialists believe that the second coming of Jesus Christ will happen after the establishment of the state of Israel, after the buildup of the temple, and that will, uh, 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 Jesus' second coming will usher the millennial kingdom after which the end of the world would arrive. So out of that belief, the uh, dispensational premillennialism, which it started in the United States, it started actually in, in Great Britain, but it moved to the United States. And since the beginning of the 19th century toward the end of the 19th century, it gained momentum and become a significant force within American Protestantism, within American evangelicism. Now, despite of the, uh, uh, of the, I would say, the visibility of the dispensational premillennialists, they were not really the majority within the evangelical church, and there were other denominations or other currents within it that were just as much influential in advancing the idea of supporting a Jewish state and the state of Israel. And the second one were the fundamentalists. Now, the fundamentalists should be discussed separately because on the one hand, all dispensational premillennialists were fundamentalists, but not all fundamentalists were dispensational premillennialists. And the fundamentalists, they, the basic idea within uh, fundamentalism is the inerrancy of the Bible. And essentially they read the Bible not as holy uh, uh, scriptures with kind of uh, 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 actual or less actual message, but really as a book of history and the book that uh, uh, should be followed by the letter. And the driving force behind their support of the idea of a Jewish state is based on Genesis 17, 8, God's promise to Abraham, to your descendants, I will give this land. For them, it's not a religious text, but actual political decree and historical truth that should be implemented as written. And the third current within uh, uh, the evangelical movement, the Protestant evangelical movement, is drawn from Genesis 12, 3, which says, I will bless them who bless you. I will curse him who curse you. This is God talking about Israel. And the proponents of that idea are called it was Daniel Hamel, historian Daniel Hamel, who presented them as a separate, and I agree with his distinction, as a separate groom within uh, uh, evangelical Protestantism. These are the covenant brotherhood who believe, and uh, it was uh, a notion that led uh, Senator James Inhofe, a Republican from Oklahoma, to state to uh, at the Senate floor after the uh, September 11 attacks. He said, one of the reasons God had blessed our country is because we have honored his people. So this is the third current within Christian evangelicals uh, 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 that support Israel out of religious uh, 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 reasons. The second constant is the idea of the shared values, which is also has to do with religion. Now, first, the idea of shared values as a theme that bonds together Israel and the United States is quite unique to the relationship between the United States and Israel. Americans don't use that term the way they use it to describe the relationship between Israel and the United States with any other nation, even with Britain, which is uh, from time to time they relate to it in these terms, uh, uh, they don't use it as often as, as consistently as they do regarding Israel. Now, these shared values, essentially, I would just really mention the two main points of the shared values, which is democracy and individual freedom. 
And they repeat these themes time and again, time and again, both presidents, officials of administration and people of all venues of life to describe the common bond that bring together the United States and Israel. Now, when they talk about democracy and the individual freedom, this is not only kind of a civic bond between the two nations. It is much stronger and it is associated with another term, which is used frequently to describe the relationship between these two states, and that is the Judeo-Christian tradition. For the Americans, democracy and individual freedom, they are not mere civic constructions. They are actually divinely ordained institutions. So when they are if compared their political institutions and values with those of Israel, they confirm that the bond between the two nations are based on a divine construct. It was that kind of bond that gave a unique meaning to the shared values and the relationship between the two nations. And I would like to uh, relate to Thomas Paine, who uh, uh, justified the American War of Independence against the British rule, which was actually a war against the king. And he explained why the Americans had the right to fight against the king. And he referred to, uh, he says, uh, Paine, and I'm quoting now, there is no truly natural or religious reason for the distinction of men into kings and subjects. Now, while the Americans were fighting against the British, he argued, government by God was first introduced into the world by the heathens, from whom the children of Israel copied the custom. However, he said, the real model that the Americans should follow is the biblical Gideon and prophet Samuel who disapproved of governments by kings. Until they turned to anoint a king on them, the Jewish form of government was a kind of a republic administered by a judge and the elders of the tribe. God was offended by the Jewish request for a king and monarchy is ranked in scriptures as one of the sins of the Jews. So the idea of democracy and individual freedom was also part of what was a, 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 a construct within American national identity, which has to do with religion. And another theme, which is, I would call it the civic, which has to do with the shared values, is the idea of the pioneer. And that is associated with American exceptionalism. And the pioneer is a kind of a basic construct within American, uh, the American perception of themselves and American national identity. And the Americans used and still use in many occasions to compare their history and the place of the pioneer within American history with the Israeli the Zionist pioneer and the Israeli pioneer. So those are the elements or the shared values that bond together Israel and the United States. And the third constant is history. And here too, we're going also uh, partly at least to religion. Part of the uh, history which Americans refer to as justification for the American support for Israel is first the biblical history. That is that the Jews has the right to return to their homeland, not only because God ordered that, but because this is part of the Jewish history. The Jews once ruled the land of Israel and they have a right now to restore their sovereignty over that piece of land. And then another part of the history that is a, a justification is the history of exile and persecution that the Jews suffered throughout 2000 years, which uh, 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 Christian world was to great extent responsible for. So now the Christian world should pay back to the Jews by helping them to restore and to go back to their homeland. And that, of course, culminated with the memory of the Holocaust, which was kind of the final demonstration of the horrible things that Christianity did to the Jews. Now, for the American Protestants, the memory of the Holocaust was even more significant because the Protestant, the German Protestant church served for the American Protestants to a great extent as the model role. That was the place where the American Protestants 
the leadership of American Protestants looked for guidance. And the fact that the German Protestants were part of the machine that eventually uh, uh, launched and implemented the Holocaust really uh, was another reason for the uh, 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 Americans to support the idea of a Jewish state and the state of Israel. Now, when we talk about, uh, about the place of ideas, the question is always, and, and it basically when we talk about ideas, of course, we are talking about what people say. Now, I won't get into that and you uh, must trust me. And if you don't trust me, go and buy the book and you will see that I have enough footnotes for that, that all these things that people, uh, the Americans were saying were kind of, uh, were followed by actions. It was not just me rhetoric. That rhetoric was always followed by actions that proved that that rhetoric was a, 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 a power that drove to action. However, before that, before you run to Amazon, I would like just to uh, uh, address the issue of the place of rhetoric in a sense that when we question the power of the rhetoric, when we ask, how can we believe a politician? Well, if we go back, for example, to 1918 or to 1917, when Wilson endorsed the Balfour Declaration, certainly we can't say that he did that because of the Jewish support, because he needed the Jewish electorate for that. That was completely irrelevant in 1917. Or in 1918, when Congress voted and discussed uh, a resolution endorsing the Balfour Declaration. And I would like to read to you one of a comment that was made by, uh, uh, just a minute, let me bring it up. You won't see it, but once again, you need to believe me that I'm reading from the text. And that is a comment that was made by Representative Charles Sloan of Nebraska. And he said, the race which in that elder day gave us the jurisprudence of Moses, the poetry of David, the eloquence of Isaiah, the philosophy of Solomon, and the valor of militant leaders from Joshua to the Maccabees, and whose members in this later day credit our professions, lead in finance, adorn our literature, and constitute much of the world's best citizenship, may well, under suitable recognition and encouragement of the allied power, repopulate the land of their fathers, and with full scope for their governmental genius, establish and maintain a government which will be a, credit, a creditable world factor. Now, a member of Congress from Nebraska in 1918, we can't suspect that he had kind of ulterior motives which went beyond his truly belief. And if I will uh, fast forward to uh, 1975, when 76 senators sent a letter to President uh, 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 Gerald Ford in protest against Ford's plan to reevaluate American relationship with the United States, the immediate reaction would be that the senators were thinking about their electorate. So Senator uh, uh, Clifford P. Case from New Jersey wrote to the, uh, told the president in a meeting that they had in the White House. And he said, the letter was representative of the true feelings of the Senate, not the pressure of Jewish groups. We do not want to see pressure put on Israel to withdraw to borders that are not defensible. I don't want this letter to be seen in the context of domestic politics. It was not an irresponsible action by the senators. It does represent the two feeling of senators concerned with Israel. And I think that, that uh, these words of the senator to the president, which were said in the White House, in a closed meeting with the president, represent the theme that ran through my book, I think, and that is the power of ideas throughout at least 200 years now. And the question about a possible shift, I think, Again, I, I, I won't even try to predict the future. I'm only predicting the past. And if there will be a shift, I will be able to explain that too. 
But I think that the continuity, as we can see it, is certainly a very dominant factor in the making of the Israeli-American relationship. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Wonderful. Um, Avi, floor is yours. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much also for your generous introduction. First of all, I would like to, uh, to congratulate uh, my old friend, David Tal, Professor Tal, for a terrific accomplishment. And, uh, and basically it's a very innovative book, which uh, upgraded for a change uh, the role of ideas as a soft factors of uh, soft attributes in, uh, uh, in American-Israeli relations because uh, the literature focused, uh, including my own writing, on the hard uh, attributes, namely on considerations related uh, to national security considerations, national interest considerations, decisions which were made by, uh, by the president, by, Amer by the government in the Pentagon, which was well, predicated almost ex exclusively or in a quintessential way on the perception of American interests and objectives in the Middle East. And uh, what David did uh, in a most comprehensive and scrupulous way wa was to show that uh, ideas matter in, in, in the sense that um, <clears throat> notions of affinity, a similarity between Israeli, Israeli history and American his history, the analogy between the pioneering spirit, uh, the spirit of the, of the West and uh, the Israeli spirit of cultivating the arid Negev actually establish a bond, a strong bond between the two cultures, between the two societies. And he shifts the focus of attention from the elites, from um, Washington decision makers to congregations, communities, um, to social groups, uh, to the public. The only, the major question, uh, and here I am uh, actually, I have some skepticism or some questions re regarding his basic thesis is, what has been the relative impact of these ideas in the fo actual formation of American foreign policy. And here I believe that the distinction or the juxtaposition between what is considered by you in the book as ephemeral, namely transient or secondary, namely perception of interests, policies, uh, and the, and the constants which, uh, which are defined by you as ideas, namely political culture, religion, history, individualism, and kind of rapport in terms of, of, of history, in terms of ethos, formative ethos. I think that actually um, you upgrade too much the role of ideas. And if you, uh, for example, take a, uh, and because number one, ideas also change, they erode. At least some components of the special relationship paradigm which comprise all of these elements which you outlined, they, uh, they, they were subject to mutation, modification and erosion over time. And for example, the idea of uh, the analogy or the similarity between the two cultures in terms of the dynamic spirit of uh, of challenging uh, the physical environment, the dynamic spirit and the uh, spirit of the pioneers is hardly relevant. It's a bit outdated in Israeli society of, uh, of today and of yesterday, namely uh, the image of uh, David fighting uh, Goliath against all odds and, uh, and uh, Israel as viewing Israel as surrounded by uh, an ocean of hostile forces Part of these ideas have eroded, became outdated completely. And I think that they're subject to change in the same way that policies and strategies, strategies were subject to change. Israel was perceived as a strategic liability at one point in time on an, another period as a strategic asset. So I think it's the nature of the interaction between the two paradigms which comprise American-Israeli relations, which is at stake. And let me illustrate, I, I think that you sometimes, uh, you do view rhetoric and public statements which uh, exp express affinity, sympathy, sympathy, empathy, identification with the Jewish state as a, basically a prelude or, or indicative of actual policies. And this has not been always the case. 
For example, uh, let me give two major illustrations since you touched upon, first of all, a Truman and, and then a Roosevelt, but you touched upon Truman, the recognition decision of 1948. And here, I don't believe that the, the question or, or Truman's decision was predicated exclusively on the basis of his attachment of biblical notions and uh, predilections uh, dictated his policy. I think, yes, uh, uh, there was humanitarian considerations. He uh, objected the British refusal to issue certificates, 100,000 certificates for two years. But again, it was uh, an election year and Truman left behind Thomas Dewey, Republican uh, uh, candidate, the governor of New York. He was behind in the polls. And, and, and by the way, the fact that he uh, spoke so uh, highly in terms of the religion, in terms of the Holy Land, in terms, I, I think it should not obfuscate the fact that American policy, that basically 48, the recognition decision, decision to recognize Israel within 11 minutes after it was formed, was an aberration, was a devi deviation from traditional uh, American foreign policy, including uh, during the Truman era. And I mean uh, aberration, a major aberration, because you mentioned Marshall, and I mentioned George Kennan, uh, Neville Anderson, Dean Acheson, James Foster, the rest. American foreign policy in the Middle East was shaped and delineated by them and not by the president. The president co cooperated almost fully with them. Arm embargo on all sides in 48, including Israel. Uh, no arm was, uh, <clears throat> was actually supplied to Israel throughout the 50s. And the Truman era, of course, was characterized, for example, part of the Israeli ethos is the collect collective, uh, collectivist uh, <clears throat> notion uh, building the kibbutzim, abolish, abolition of, of uh, private property. Was this notion perceived with enthusiasm and, and cheers in Washington? Israel was perceived by the Pentagon as a security risk. It was denied access to um, strategic programs uh, which were inextricably related to the Cold War because Israel was a socialist society. It was an embodiment of the socialist uh, socialist uh, ideas of, again, uh, not individualism, collectivism. And I think there was a, not only a, a reserv reservations or resentment or some hostility toward Israel by the American uh, policy elite. And, and Truman, by the way, Truman objected, uh, refused to mediate between Israel and the Federal Republic of Germany concerning the reparation. It simply refused. Not to mention, I would say, uh, some of uh, uh, the present policies, and not only his kind of mild anti-Semitic uh, remarks. Uh, he, he hated the deplore to be uh, uh, to be pressured by uh, by Jewish groups. Even in '48, but he resented it profoundly. But in terms of of actually uh, policy, uh, I think uh, it was very reserved and very and and and. and uh, and quite, I would say, uh, uh, fundamentally different from, from the notion, from the ideas which maybe permeated uh, his thinking on an abstract level. Take the Eisenhower era, it was even worse. You call the era as a friendly, uh, even handedness. I would have termed it as a unfriendly or hostile even handedness. Yes, Eisenhower was uh, the one who freed some of the concentration camps, Bergen Belsen, and was shocked to see the horrors, horrors of the Holocaust. And he always depicted Israel, Israel not so much in biblical terms, as you point out in the book, but in uh, cultural terms. He, he, he admired the Israeli uh, dynamic spirit, etc. It's a pioneering spirit. But his policy, his policy was, his policy was quite hostile because it was, sub his, it was predicated upon the notion of forging an inter-Arab alliance which should augment NATO and help contain Soviet encroachment and expansion. And uh, the, I guess uh, what derived from this notion was, uh, I guess, to maintain a distance from Israel because any involvement, any inclusion of Israel in, in, 
this design, strategic design, was perceived as likely to doom the whole notion because the Arab world would defect in view of the Arab-Israeli conflict, etc. So, so Israel was treated with kind of a, a, with a high, high measure of a skepticism. A, take a few peace plans which were inaugurated during the Eisenhower era, Alpha Plan, which sought to divide the Negev into two to establish a corridor between Egypt and Jordan. Uh, the whole notion of the Baghdad Pact, refusal to sell arms, to uh, events in which, in which comprehensive sanctions were imposed. 1953, the water dispute, and 56, of, of course, Sinai War. And then during the Sinai War, really it, it was, he was hospitalized. Secretary Dallas was very hostile in his private messages to his, uh, to his friend, uh, friends in trying to mobilize public opinion against Israel. Uh, telling them that, well, and he was, of course, very religious. Uh, are you going to let uh, the Jews or alien power to, to dictate our foreign policy? You have to mobilize, to organize, and to provide support to our policy, etc., etc., etc. And uh, And I think maybe the, the, the best or the worst case, oh, Henry Byrod in the 50s, in the 40s, who called the uh, uh, who supported a, a forced uh, settlement of the of the Arab Israeli dispute and and threatened Moshe Sharet was the prime minister at the time uh, threatened that Israel would be totally isolated if it does not co cooperate etc cetera, etc cetera. and concerning uh, uh, President Roosevelt you mentioned thirty nine Roosevelt opposition to the British uh, 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 policy of uh, draconic white paper, which uh, drastically limited the number of uh, uh, Jewish refugees uh, uh, to Palestine by the British. But at the same time, during the same month, Roosevelt watched the St. Louis vessel and kind of circ circling the American, uh, uh, American ports, by the way, including Cuba. And uh, 700 Jewish refugees from Europe were denied access, entrance, and had to return to Europe uh, with all the consequences to, to face the music of death and concentration camps. And Rudolf himself, his, his declared policy was to keep a low profile concerning the Holocaust. Because if, if you, as he told uh, Rabbi Stephen Wise and Rabbi, Silver, if you make it very, if we cry loud against the Holocaust and every, everything was known by 42, 43, we are giving Hitler and Goebbels another additional ammunition to label the war as an American war for the sake of Judaism. And that was the reason, main reason, why he actually remained silent despite the request and please from, by the way, from Eleanor with Roosevelt or from Henry Morgenthau, the Secretary of the, the Treasury, it was only in 44, and, and by the way, uh, true, uh, Roosevelt's uh, key uh, person in terms of, uh, in, was in charge of visa, Breckenridge Long, fiercely resisted the issuing of visas to Jewish refugees because they would not be they would not integrate. They were also security risk. They were from Eastern Europe. They were socialist. And the, the number of visas which were issued to Jews during the war was minimal. It was only in 44 that he was challenged by Morgenthau in the Senate. So the only initiative which uh, President Roosevelt uh, made and which was perhaps reflected some of his ideas took place on the eve of his death in February 45 following the Yalta uh, uh, conference um, when, he was, when he met King Saud aboard of the um, <clears throat> Quincy uh, uh, <clears throat> a battleship. And I don't have to elaborate what happened in this meeting. And uh, so basically, and you can uh, proceed all the way from uh, uh, not to Wilson, Wilson 1917, again, maybe an exception, but it didn't uh, 
Lido didn't have any major consequence, consequences in the 1917. There were also political strategic issues involved in the same way that they were, they were involved in the original Balfour plan. Uh, there were all kinds of strategic considerations which were integrated uh, into the decision to, to issue the original Balfour Declaration. Ideas never acted kind of in, in a vacuum. They were always, they had to be introduced into the political system. And I view them more as a constraint rather than an independent variable that shaped and, and shaped American policy. So the, the debate, or if you can call it a debate, or the disagreement is over the extent, the nature of the interaction between ideas and, uh, and interest. And it's an endless debate. It's a matter of interpretation. And since we don't have any permanent or dominant paradigms here, as Karl Popper said, it's only uh, we try to falsify and uh, not, uh, nothing is axiomatic or dogmatic. It's a matter of uh, emphasis and interpretation. And my interpretation may be because I was I was the Hans Morgenthau students, not Henry, uh, is a little bit more uh, hardcore realistic. Maybe it's outdated too, but I guess that the, that's the beauty of the field that we have different perspectives. You are, you are more, well, a constructivist, if I can term you. And I think it's, it's the nature of interaction and, and the magnitude of the factors involved, which make it so complex, so complicated, and so fascinating. I understand Yael from that I'm kind of overreaching or. Yeah, no, this is absolutely fascinating, but. Um, let me stop here. Yeah, let, let's stop here. Thank you, Avi. That was um, a, a great response and there are great questions in the chat. Uh, it, it's really kind of, uh, um, there's the question of interests versus ideas as, as the driving forces of history is really coming, coming to the fore here. Um, but we'll leave time for questions later. And so now uh, let us um, turn uh, to our next set of speakers and then try to bring it all together in the discussion. Um, and Professor uh, Jonathan Reinhold is the head of the Department of Political Studies at Bar Ilan University. His book entitled The Arab-Israeli Conflict in American Political Culture, published by Cambridge University Press won the Israeli Association for Political Science Prize for the best book of 2015. In the past year, he has published articles on the future of US-Israeli relations, on democratic attitudes towards Israel and the Palestinians, the pro-Israel lobby and the Iran deal, as well as a book chapter on evangelicals and Israel. He is currently at work on the institutionalization of the US Israeli strategic relationship, and will give us a taste uh, of this forthcoming work. And responding to him will be our uh, fearless leader, Dr. Yoav Fomel, who is the head of the Center for the Study of the United States in partnership with the Fulbright Program at Tel Aviv University. His research focuses on post-war American liberalism, conservatism and foreign relations. His book, The Moderate Imagination about the decline of New Deal liberalism was published in 2020. And his latest article, A Taste from a forthcoming book um, called Daniel Patrick Moynihan and the Politics of Tragedy has just been published in the winter edition of the Reviews of Politics. So without further ado, Jonathan, the floor is yours. Um, oh, could you mute Avi, whom I think is still on? Yeah, just a sec. Has Jonathan disappeared? I'm still here. Can you hear me? You are here. Fantastic. Yes, okay. I can hear you. Go right. ahead. Okay. So first of all, thank you to both. Uh, thank you, Yael, and thank you to Avi and David for a fascinating um, discussion. And I'm gonna um, kick off from where they left off, actually, um, and look at how um, strategic interests and other factors such as domestic politics and values and ideas and culture um, affect certain critical moments 
in the US Israeli relationship. Um, because I don't think that they have a constant impact um, that is constant all the way through the relationship. I, my hypothesis for this book is that um, in building the strategic relationship, the interest element, strategic interest is dominant in the stage of setting it up, of institutionalizing it. But once it's institutionalized, then it can be held in place by things that are not to do with interest because the cost in terms of taking something down, removing something is politically higher once it's institutionalized. So that's my basic thesis. And today I'm going to talk mainly about the first part, about the process of institutionalization and less about why it persists and why it's embellished. So there is just some examples of the types of strategic cooperation that exists between the United States and Israel. Um, and on the right, you see the critical junctures that I'm going to discuss, and I'll go into them a little bit later. And some of the issues um, that make up that coordination, whether it's the supply of arms, research and development, intelligence cooperation, ex joint exercises, planning, policy coordination. Um, so if you read all the material on US Israeli relations, you'll notice that the word institutions is missing. Uh, there is no reference uh, to the institutionalization of the US Israeli relationship. Uh, in fact, there's not a lot on the institutionalization of bilateral relationships. There is on multilateral. So, you know, I've put NATO there. So there's a lot written about the institutionalization of NATO, but much less about bilateral, including the US and Israel. So what do I mean by institutions? I mean, uh, a set of connected organizations, formal rules, informal norms, and public policies. So it's not just a building. It's a set of, uh, of interacting elements, one of which can be described, described as the policy scape. That is, the, the, the set of the thicket of past policies that establish institutions and agendas which feed back into the policy making process, reshaping the political environment and thus subsequent outcomes. So an example would be the fact that following pressure from a certain senator called Lyndon Johnson, um, the Eisenhower administration made a written commitment to Israel that it would see the closing of the Straits of Tehran, the closing of international waterways as a causus belli, means that when that happens in 1967, Israel's actions have legitimacy, which they didn't have in 1956. And that becomes important in how America and how the administration understands how to proceed diplomatically after the war because Israel's victory in both cases was militarily quick and successful. So there's no difference in the military element. There's a difference in the diplomatic element. So what, what do we mean by institutionalization? Well, we're talking about it having an impact when it produces a reinforcing dynamic that could reproduce an outcome in the absence of the original cause. So a very simple example is a QWERTY keyboard, which was originally designed to stop the keys sticking together by separating those keys that are used more often in English. But even though that's completely irrelevant, the cost of changing that for computers because people got so used to it was not worth it. It's too high. And so we continue to use a QWERTY keyboard. So you could think of it like this. There may have been very, very powerful strategic interests that pushed the United States to grant Israel huge quantities of aid and um, arms. Those, those interests may, may no longer be so powerful, but 
when a president like President Obama, who, who told his head of his CIA, he didn't see any American interest in protecting Israel's qualitative edge, he nonetheless perhaps did more than anybody else to do exactly that and to give Israel a huge aid package because the costs of reversing that yeah, were very great. Okay, when we talk about institutionalization, um, it's a tipping point or a critical juncture. It can be the result of sand very slowly um, building into a pile and then suddenly tipping over. So it can be a slow process or it can come at a critical juncture that's very, very quick and a lot happens in a very short time. These are really descriptive categories. They, they're not um, mutually exclusive. So when I'm going to look at the critical junctures, I'm going to look at four cases um, that relate to aspects of the strategic relationship. The reference point for peace, UN Security Council 242, and the fact that Israel didn't have to withdraw and what that has institutionalized as opposed to 1956. The nuclear understanding that Israel and the United States reached over the um, textile factory in the south of Israel, the memorandum of strategic understanding that was reached in 1975, which institutionalized the long term American commitment to supply arms and economic aid to Israel. And it also institutionalized a modus operandi of Israel makes concessions for peace territorially it receives compensation and um, that is supposed to uh, balance the risks it's taking by increasing its uh, military power. So it's territorially more vulnerable, but uh, militarily stronger. And the, the final example is um, the memorandum of understanding that's reached in 1983, which triggers um, the, in, the uh, setting off of military and defense cooperation. No American chief of staff visits Israel before this. There are no joint maneuvers between the Israeli army and the US before this. There is no technological cooperation on defense systems before this. So each of these are important points of institutionalization. It doesn't mean right, that there was no arms and aid before, or there was no understandings on nuclear agreements before. No, it means that this is the pivot point at which it becomes institutionalized and therefore much, much harder to reverse. So you have the UN um, and 242, just as an example, you have the prior failure, you have the layering of it, additional layers at Camp David and Oslo, and you have attempts to reverse it. And, and when I reach the second part of my book, which I haven't written yet, I will look at why those attempts to reverse it fail or not in the case of Trump, question mark, uh, and why um, and how uh, why the layering occurs. Is it easier to add than it is to create? Um, then we have the 1969, 1975, and the Star Wars of uh, 1983. So what are the factors, the causal factors or a causal package um, that, that I'm taking into account? So I'm looking at the, the, the normal things that one looks at in US-Israel relations, strategic interests, culture and values, the lobby, domestic politics, but also bureaucratic politics and policy entrepreneurship. Who makes the decision? That's one of the things that Avi spoke about before. It matters whether Truman's taking the decision or not, and it matters how skillful politicians are. Um, without Henry Kissinger's political skill, I think it's questionable whether the Second Sinai uh, Agreement would have been reached and questionable whether that memorandum would have been signed. Um, there's also the reinforcing factor of when US-Israel relations produces something that becomes institutionalized broadly internationally, the partition resolution 242, that in itself 
becomes a factor. And then, and then there's the external actors. How external actors, Israel, the Arab side, other states, particularly the Soviet Union, will affect how America, um, how the four factors I have in the center, how they play out. In other words, um, America doesn't make its policy in a vacuum. It's not static. It's affected by how the other sides um, uh, relate to American values, relate to American domestic politics, relate to strategic interests. So if we take what Yael mentioned in her introduction, there's no doubt that the way that Netanyahu, not the essence, but the way he opposed the Iran deal in 2015 affected um, the way that Democrats, number two, domestic politics, see Israel, number three, in terms of culture and values. And there are also dynamics and issues that, that fall between these. So the fact that Americans as a, a believe as a strategy in liberal internationalism is something that falls both in strategic interests and in cultures and values. And informal lobbying um, happens because there is some kind of um, cultural foundation. Uh, it's not to do with power. Um, Weitzman and Eddie Jacobson can get, uh, Eddie Jacobson gets Weitzman into the White House, not because of domestic politics and not because of strategic interest, because they're friends and because he knows how to, how to, how to twist his friend to feel guilty. Um, so it is politics because it's a form of lobbying. But it's one that's founded on culture and values of, of, a, of a kind of relationship. And it's one that finds expression not in elections and not in lobbying activity, threatening not to vote for you, but in the bureaucratic politics. It feeds into who gets access to the main decision making. And then there's another factor that I think is very important, and that's to do with um, what Eisenhower referred to is I have two kinds of problems, the urgent and the important. How urgent is something and how important is it? It could be that the strategic interest in a two state solution is very important, but winning the election in the, you know, at the beginning of November is very urgent. And since we're not going to reach a two state solution before the election, I might push aside that interest temporarily in my own head. Um, and then I can say afterwards, well, we'll deal with that later. The only problem is that once I make a decision that to, for example, give the domestic political a, uh, an advantage over a short time, that may then develop and institutionalize and become a much bigger hurdle than I thought it was. And I think that's one of the things that happens in 1967 with settlements. And it's one of the reasons why they don't impact on 242. Okay, I'm not gonna go to, so although I'm focused on the strategic relationship and institutionalization, I wanted to have a baseline case where there's no strategic relationship and no institutions. So then I can measure how different things are against that. So I took American support for the creation of the state. And it turns out, according to my analysis, this is a very high threshold for getting that through. You've got to have the key decision maker, the president, he's got to have some kind of non-interest based reason for taking this up. And in Truman's case, it's humanitarian. It's the 100,000 Jews after the Holocaust. He makes it a priority because it matters to him. Um, not because he's a political Zionist, but because he's an American liberal who cares about these things, liberal with a small L, right? Um, but he would have given up on the 100,000 when the British didn't move, had the lobby not made it a political interest because the Republicans took it up. In other words, he wasn't acting to win support. He was acting to prevent losing support. And that's very important. And then had the bureaucracy made the critical decisions um, at the time of the vote in 1947 at the UN vote, 
America would not have acted to secure the two-thirds majority required in the General Assembly to pass the partition resolution, which has made since then, and since the creation of Israel, the idea of a one imposing a one-state solution illegitimate. And that's a huge fact in the nature of the politics of the Arab-Israeli conflict and in the debate in America about US-Israeli relations, including and notwithstanding Peter Bynum. Um, because if it wasn't for the president and his advisors within the White House, going behind the backs of the State Department to lobby other countries and promise them all sorts of things, then there would not have been a two thirds majority. And finally, despite all of that, that still wouldn't have been enough because the Soviets, by the Soviet Union coming out just a little bit before the partisan resolution as having suddenly discovered after 30 years of opposition that it might actually support the Jewish state, um, that's critical. It's critical because it kills one of the best arguments of the bureaucratic opponents of a Jewish state, which is that the, the, the Soviets will benefit if America recognizes a Jewish state. Well, they won't. Um, and the other factor is that despite all of that, had the Arabs accepted the plan put forward by Grady Morrison, which was a plan for a one state solution, a kind of federal solution in which the Jews would kind of have autonomy in some of the area of Palestine. Had they done that and had they accepted 100,000 Jewish immigrants, there would be no American support for the creation of a Jewish state. That was Truman's preference. It's the Arab um, in unwillingness to compromise on anything and the Zionist understanding that they had to compromise in order to keep apart from anything else, to keep the Americans engaged, which allows Truman to pick it up and keep running with it. And despite all of that, had Truman believed that it was an important American strategic interest to stop this, that it really would help the Soviets yeah, to gain control of the Middle East, he would not have supported it. The key for Truman was if the Yishuv can win the fight on its own, I'm willing to support them. What I'm not willing to do is send American troops because I don't have enough in Europe. I don't have enough in the Far East, and that would damage America's strategic interests. And so some of the back and forth is to do with that. And once Truman's convinced of that, yeah, He's happy to go along. And that's why he's happy with the arms embargo as well, because that stops him getting involved. So the arms embargo and the recognition of Israel come from the same lowering, it's the same kind of understanding of the strategic interest. I'll talk, Yael, yeah, how long have I got? Uh, I, I want to say two minutes. Two minutes, fine. So, and, so I can't- That's really, generous. That's generous. Okay, so I'm, I, I can't really go into great detail about um, 242, but I, what I'm trying to show is that there are, it's a conglomeration of factors and the order in which they happen within the critical juncture is very, very important. Okay, so I can't, I don't have time to go into that or, or really- But you have amazing slides, which I- I would, do have amazing slides, it's yeah, true, but, but should, if I've only uh, got- Two minutes, I can't. Yeah. I, I wish we had an hour and a half to go over them one by one. Um, okay. But we don't. We but don't. We don't. So I will just jump to, to the last line where we've done we've done that. Hang on, let me just see if I can. Okay, let's do let's just finish with point number five, which is what happens when domestic politics and strategic interests collide. And what so far from my research I can surmise is this when there is a definite and urgent short-term political interest it can trump uncertain long-term strategic interests so that would be um in 1967 the american concern about settlements about israel applying law uh, israeli law to 
uh, East Jerusalem and about it's possible Jordanian negotiations, all those could be put to the side because they were not seen as immediate interests and, and, and other concerns could therefore come into play. And equally the other way around, when it is a definite and urgent strategic interest, it will trump even definite, clear, short-term domestic political interests. And that's clear with Kennedy in 63 over the nuclear issue. And it's clear with Kissinger and, um, and Nixon in, uh, and Ford in 1975. Kissinger may have cried in the car with Rubin about what he was doing to Israel, but he still did it. All right, that's a great way to end. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Oh, wow, okay. Well, um, sadly, uh, we need to let go of Gal Gadot and uh, move to Yoav Formel. Yoav, um, give us your take. Yoav, you need to unmute yourself or someone needs to unmute him. Yeah, right. Yeah. Now it's okay. Uh, all right, so I, I will uh, be, be, be brief, right? Because uh, we do want to have some time here for a Q&A. Uh, I, I just want to say, first of all, this is a great pleasure and it's been uh, you know, fascinating. And I, I wish we could do this in person, but we will do it in person next time. So, so this is just kind of a taste of, of something uh, that, we, that we plan to do in the future. Uh, I, I think one of the wonderful things here is also the interdisciplinary conversation that we've had Right, because some of us are political scientists, some of us are historians, and I think that's what also makes kind of the, the synergy here so interesting because we're looking at this from very different uh, perspectives. So I, I, I just I'm, I'm, I'm just going to make two comments about about the, the the part of John's manuscript that I had the the pleasure of reading, and it really was a pleasure. Uh, and so first of all, I, I want to say that this that right, John has highlighted a very important link in the scholarship that has so far been mostly overlooked. And, and it is this, this idea of, of institutionalization, right? And, and it's this question that, that we haven't really been asking enough. Uh, and, and it's what sustains the special relationship and how sustainable, how durable and solid is it in the long term, right, to begin with. And by looking at, at and it's a historical process that you know he looks at it as a political science, but he uses historical case studies uh, which he presented some of them just now to, to show how this is institutionalized, you know, since 1948. Uh, and uh, and I think uh, rather than, than, than kind of take, take the relationship for granted, inevitably, as many Israelis and Americans, I think, still do, it, John's method uh, and using these case studies and looking at various milestones in the development of the relationship I think it, it reveals something very important and, and it's maybe even counterintuitive, but it's how fragile uh, and more than anything else, how contingent uh, the process of institutionalizing the special relationship has become. And, and right, and John just showed one of the previous uh, slides was all of those layers, the cultural, the, the, the religious, the strategic, the, the international uh, factors, right? But you take out one layer and, and in a way it, it could have all turned out very different. And I think just uh, what what we saw, uh, what I saw at least from reading John's manuscript, is that is that lacking a clear, firm decision in which the U.S. mobilizes all its power and diplomatic capital uh, in order to offer kind of a clear, definable, com definable commitment for for Israel's security, as it does do with other allies. Then John shows, I think that that it at, at least in the beginning much of the special relationship is rooted in circumstance, in coincidence, uh, may, maybe even in, in luck, right? I, I would even say in luck in, in certain moments. Uh, and, and that, you know, ostensibly even paltry developments and events ultimately added up, they finally pushed the US beyond that threshold uh, time and again in 1948 and then 67 and, and then in the 70s and 80s, some of the later case studies he shows, which I haven't read yet, uh, into finally consolidating kind of the special relationship really beginning in the mid seventies in Sinai II and, and then in the eighties with some of the more formal uh, the MOUs that, that were signed. Uh, so just the, the two main points that I wanna make here. Uh, one is, is the talking about institutionalization. What exactly do we talk about when we talk about institutionalization of the US-Israel relationship? Uh, 
uh, one of the most striking things that reveal themselves, uh, to me at least, is, is just how uninstitutionalized the relationship actually is, how messy it is, uh, frankly, or how Israeli it is in many ways, at least in comparison with America's other strategic partners. And here I think a comparative aspect would be really helpful uh, to, to this study in order to understand how special or, or you know, sui generis at least is, is kind of the Israeli-American relationship. And what, what, what do I mean by that is that uh, the US, unlike other defense packs, strategic defense packs that the US has with its equally close allies, right? Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, in the Far East, certainly with NATO, uh, all, all of these are established obviously in the early stages of the Cold War. Uh, the Israeli-American relationships lacks a lot of the structural guarantees that those other commitments have, foremost among them a codified legally binding commitment ratified by the Senate, right? And that, that's a big deal. Uh, that could outlast any temporary public mood or individual president or congressional advocacy of Israel. Uh, and secondly, also the, the US-Israel lacks the, the actual physicality, right? The basis, the fact that the US has a lot of bases in Japan, in South Korea, in, 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 in a lot of the NATO allies, which really consolidates that relationship in a physical manner that the US and Israel uh, don't have. In, in that sense, I think while there are formal commitments uh, toward Israel that, that, that are the foundations of John's study, right? He looks at uh, arms supply, military aid, arms control, the peace process and defense uh, cooperation. Many of those are codified in, in congressional resolutions, presidential affirmations, the MOUs, of course. Uh, Israel still acts, I think that, which makes these alliances so entrenched. Uh, and John mentioned before the 1957 uh, commitment, right, that, that Eisenhower, that the Eisenhower administration offers Israel uh, uh, about free shipping in the Straits of, Tur of uh, Tehran, and that, that becomes a big deal in 1967, as John mentioned. But the irony of that example, uh, and, and he writes about this in the book, is the fact that in 67, the State Department, and this I forgot about this, it, it misplaces or it loses that actual commitment. It kind of forgets it made that commitment to, to the security of international shipping of Israeli shipping, right? Kind of going out of the Suez Canal to the effect that Johnson has to call up Eisenhower to and have him, you know, remind everyone publicly that he actually gave Israel that guarantee, right? So even that example actually shows us, I think in many ways for me uh, that how uninstitutionalized the, the special relationship actually is. So that, that's the first thing I wanted to, to mention. And I do think a comparative aspect here with America's other strategic partners, especially in, in the 50s, 60s, would really kind of uh, enhance this uh, discussion. The second thing has to do with, the con is with, with contingencies, right? And given the contingencies of the special relationship, uh, what one cannot help but read this and wonder, what would it take to deinstitutionalize this relationship? And I think exactly because of, of all of these conditions and, and all of this, uh, you know, all of this uh, minor, a set of, of minor events and decisions that are made, John calls them chains, kind of. So you have all of these chains that lead to the institutionalization, but it's enough that one chain is, is broken. So, so I think that given how coincidental many of the developments have been, in the history of US-Israel relations. Uh, and here I'm reminded Avi once actually wrote an article and he called it stumbling into the special relationship. And, and I really like that because in a way it is stumbling. And, and one cannot help but wonder, I think about the fragility therefore of these bonds. Uh, and I, 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 re, I know I'd like to call it the, the it's a wonderful life. I, I love that movie, the it's a wonderful life scenario because even the slightest modification in the history of the relationship, right? Maybe Nasser being a little less intransigent in 56 or 67 or Truman and Johnson lacking those personal kind of, you know, Jewish Zionist friendships and that informal lobbying with people like Eddie Jacobson or Abe Fortas, uh, then even then if you're missing one of those links, then everything might've turned out differently, right? And maybe we don't get to that threshold that allows the US to institutionalize uh, the relationship. Uh, and, and in that sense, I, I think, uh, Again, looking comparatively might be very helpful. Uh, I, I, I think a lot about Taiwan uh, because like Israel, Taiwan enjoys a very close strategic alliance with the US uh, and it even has a mutual defense pact, right? That's ratified by the Senate. 
kind of, and for 25 years, between 1955 and 1980, uh, Taiwan has a very strong pro kind of Taiwanese lobby in the United States in these years. Uh, and, and Chiang Kai-shek, I know people forget this in the 40s, Chiang Kai-shek was a celebrity in the US in the 30s, 40s, he's, he's constantly on the cover of Time Magazine. Uh, and, and yet, right, Almost abruptly, uh, Nixon's one China policy changes all of that. There's a strategic shift exactly 50 years ago next month, right? If, if we're thinking historically, when Nixon goes to China uh, and that, that unilateral shift, right? That it, it, it leads to the gradual deinstitutionalization of US-Taiwan relations quite abruptly. Uh, and in that sense, the president, you know, it was Nixon at the time, sensing an urgent strategic interest, in this case, opening up China, uh, and tearing it away from the Soviet Union and then also enabling him, of course, to end the Vietnam War. Uh, this you know, allows Nixon to exercise executive power even in the face of congressional opposition uh, and, and push forward kind of a, a very transformative strategic reorientation towards China, right? The People's Republic of China at the expense of a very long time close ally like Taiwan. So I, I think in that sense, that is something uh, that, that we should keep in mind comparatively uh, and finally, I think if we think about what, and, and I think here I'm already, this is a segue to, to, the, to maybe just uh, some of the Q&A in a few minutes, uh, you know, how fragile or how durable is the special relationship? And in, in that sense, what might it take to deinstitutionalize it, right? And, and to, to kind of push back and to dissolve it or undermine it. And, and just looking at some of the case studies in, in the part of the book uh, that I read, you could see a few very important changes that suggest that maybe, uh, you know, this isn't such a, a wild scenario. And I do think we need to, to think about some of the contemporary challenges that might destabilize and even deinstitutionalize the, the special relationship. And I'll just, you know, some of the examples, and I'll conclude with that. Uh, throughout, the, you know, John looks in both when he looks at Truman and he looks at uh, LBJ. He looks at the Democratic Party and, and he writes, right? He writes wonderfully, I forgot the passage, but he says something along the line of that much of the institutionalization was rooted in people like LBJ and Hubert Humphrey and Eugene Rostow and Arthur Goldberg and their personal sympathies toward Israel. Today's Democratic Party, and this is no, you know, this is no news to anyone here, is not that party. You don't have that sympathy. You don't have these individuals. It's a completely new demography uh, and it's a completely new party. So. That, of course, is, is changing. Uh, you know, uh, we look, one of the other things he found is Arab rejectionism and Israeli diplomatic moderation. We, meant, we mentioned before Netanyahu and Obama, what happens if, if that Arab rejectionism suddenly uh, wanes and, right, and there's a new kind of Arab uh, approach embracing dialogue and the peace process, maybe something along the lines of the 2002 Saudi uh, peace plan on one hand, and with Israel, not, you know, not continuing in that diplomatic moderation that characterized it in the 60s and 70s, but rather Israel being kind of more intransigent. Uh, you know, what does that do to the special relationship? Uh, and, and finally, then also just the question of unilateralism. One of the things that, that appear constantly in the case studies John alludes to is, is the fact that Israel always kept America, certainly on the eve of the 1967 war, Right, it consulted with, with the Johnson administration. Eshkol was very careful about that, not to do anything unilaterally that would kind of uh, enrage or, or alienate America. And what happens now, if we're looking at a potential attack in Iran, right? can Israel do that without prior approval uh, and coordination with the United States? And, and if, if it does do that, what might that do to the relationship, right? I'll conclude with that and, and Yael, so maybe we could have some time for Q&A. Okay, uh, thank you. That was really fantastic. Uh, and thank you to all four of you. I've learned so much and have so many questions to all of you. Um, but I will be uh, generous towards the audience and start with their questions. Um, and I'll, I'll take the, the question that I'm going to that I would like uh, to, to begin with is the one that really ties directly to what Yoav was just saying. And it was asked by uh, Ira Sharp. Uh, who is writing, uh, American society has undergone major shifts in the last 20 years due to multiple factors, Iraq, Afghanistan, the Obama era, followed by the Trump era, and now the pandemic. Uh, 
there is polarization between right and left with the center becoming weaker. Israel, once viewed favorably by both major parties, is now viewed differently by many. Palestinians are viewed differently as well between left and right. What are the changes in the shift in American politics having in the special relationship? And I think this question really uh, um, brings to sharp relief the, the tensions between ideas and interests, constants and change, institutions versus particular personalities, moments uh, that, that I think are underlying uh, our, our conversation today. So uh, all four of you are qualified to respond. Uh, who would like to go first? Your pick, Yael. All right, David, so why don't you? Because this is in some ways- uh, yeah, my, my, answer will be the shortest. my answer will be the shortest, I believe because that question is really about, uh, um, I would say a field of knowledge that I have no uh, knowledge at all about that is about the future. Uh, mm -hmm. the, only, the only answer that I can give is that throughout the years of relationship between Israel and the United States, the question of a possible change, a possible worsening of the relationship because, because something happened, that goes through the history of the Israeli-American relationship all along from 1948 up to almost yesterday morning or today's morning. So, uh, so uh, I really have no idea, but I would say that uh, at least as long as these constants that I described, at least as they are in power, <clears throat> my assumption is that the line of continuity will prevail. Okay. I'm not going to swear about that, but I think that we That's saw these ostensible ups and downs but still the vector remained all along that the special relationship kept their power and durability. Okay, thank you. Avi, do you wanna? Yeah, I, just, I think that it's a matter of, let me uh, allude to the 75, to uh, Jonathan reference to the uh, 75 uh, uh, initiative by 76 uh, uh, senators actually to uh, who confronted President Ford and, and, and Secretary Kissinger and, and basically forced him to provide Israel with compensation, uh, actually which led to the Sinai II agreement. I don't see the same broadly based infrastructure of support for Israel in American public opinion, namely in Congress as well. And I think that Israel's success in maintaining or bolstering its relations uh, was that it really enjoyed uh, this kind of um, broad level of social uh, um, cultural support, uh, bipartisan support. And again, Congress was only one, uh, one, one, one chain, but it of course originated in the, in the in broad segments of American society who supported Israel, for example, in 67 wholeheartedly, 10, uh, at least 1,000 Americans volunteers and, and, and came to Israel to identify and to actually assist Israel. Not all of them were Jews. I don't see the same uh, level of support, uh, mobilization, and uh, support for the ideas embodied in the special relationship uh, paradigm uh, recur today. And I think that the vast so social change, demographic change, cultural change, uh, is, is bound to affect American policy because it, it's not, uh, it was never formulated in a, in a void. And so in the absence of this kind of sense of solidarity, identification, uh, identification with the narrative, with the ethos, with the history, I believe in, in, in the defection of the democratic society, defection of the backbone of the, of uh, Jewish, of Jewish support, the, the, the liberal the reforms community, uh, uh, they defected more or less in terms of affiliation and mobilization. I think that American foreign policy is bound to reflect it. Uh, well, maybe not tomorrow or today in, right. in Biden's era, but I think it, it is bound to be reflected in, in the pursuit of American policy. Right. I mean, and I think in, in, in some way, uh, there may not be uh, 
one America anymore in the same way that there is no such thing as one Israel. I mean, often support for Israel is actually support for a particular Israeli government and its policies, uh, which is not necessarily supported uh, by uh, the citizenry uh, as, as a whole, as should be in a democratic country. Um, let's go back to the question that was uh, uh, asked here first. Um, and that takes us uh, again um, into the future, but perhaps this is the nature of, of uh, the Q&A, and that's the impact of, of COVID on um, the- Yeah, the can, I, can I talk about the previous question? Oh, would you, uh, yes, please go ahead. You know, I'm being British, I, I was waiting my turn. Well, because, I'm being uh, Israeli, and uh, you know, yeah. whoever, yeah. Because whatever because your for, your yeah. questioner received a check from me to ask that question because I actually have an article about it that was published Which about a year ago. We will all promptly download and and read. John. So okay. you should. So you should. Um, look, I think that you need to when you look at the changes and the Democrats, and it is mainly the Democrats. Um, then I think uh, the, the important thing to, and let me just stop the share. Yeah, the important thing to realize is there are a number of things going on. The first is that what Israel does is very, very important in affecting Democrats' attitudes to Israel. So Democrats, despite becoming increasingly liberal between 2000 and 2014, consistently preferred, sympathized with more Israel rather than the Palestinians. It's only since 2015 that that's collapsed. And it collapsed because the Prime Minister of Israel decided to take sides in American politics at the very time where the, uh, each, the supporters of each party have never hated each other more since polling began. Um, so that was foolish. And of course, we have a purely right wing government between 2000 and two, uh, 2015 and 2021, which means that if you're a moderate Democrat and nearly all Democrats support a two state solution, you have no one to identify. There's no Ehud Barak, there's no Zippy Livni to soften it for you. Um, so the real question is, is how how much is the cake baked? Can it be unbaked by this government or has it solidified? Um, there are several reasons to think in either direction. The first thing, if you want to be positive, is to say that despite the change in attitudes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, two thirds of Democrats have a positive view of the state of Israel. And that hasn't changed in the last 20 years because when they're asked that question by um, Gallup, they're asked it in the context of lots of different other countries. So they don't think of Israel as engaged in the conflict with the Palestinians. But when you ask about that, when you ask about that conflict, you get a different question. The other thing I would say is in terms of American Jews, they are very deeply divided about what Israel should do. But when they're asked, um, are the Palestinians serious about peace? They're divided about whether the Israeli government is, but they're not at all divided about whether the Palestinians are. Whether you're a form, whether you're unaffiliated, whether you're orthodox or whether you're conservative, the percentage that thinks that is less than 15%. And that is still a very powerful factor. Um, thank you. All right, um, good. That that uh, what was indeed important. Um, does anyone want uh, to think about the world post COVID and whether that will influence the Israel US partnership, relationship, alliance, however you wish to call it? Yoav, do you want to speculate? Uh, uh, I'll uh, I won't speculate, but I'll just say what, what, what we already know in the last decade, America's primary strategic interests are, are, not, are moving away from us, right? They're moving away from the Middle East. Uh, one of the, again, you know, we, we don't need to get into to debate the, the merits of, of, the, of, of Obama's uh, Iran rapprochement, but, but at the end of the day, 
Obama understood, what Trump understood, and what Biden understood, and that American foreign policy is, is moving to Northeast Asia, to the Pacific. Uh, even Europe is becoming secondary. That's why we're seeing everything in Ukraine. The U.S. isn't really, be, isn't really doing anything in Ukraine because it, it, it can't, and it's not in its primary strategic interest, not even in its secondary. So Russia is basically doing what it wants to do in Ukraine. And eventually it's, it's going to reach the region. I think obviously the Middle East is still of, of great import. I'm not, I'm not you know, undermining that. But as, as you know, the focus is moving there, whether we want it or not. And the U.S. needs stability in the region. It needs it in the Gulf, in the energy markets, and in prices of oil so that it can focus on its primary concern, and that is containing China. Right. I mean, I would add to that um, that we're in the era or entering the era of the climate catastrophe, and the interests of the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. in that era will be completely different than they were uh, in the 20th century when that was not a consideration. And so we're definitely going to be living in a world that is different uh, from what, the one that has been uh, analyzed uh, so uh, productively in uh, your talks and responses. And so I would like to thank all four of you for uh, truly uh, riveting um, interventions this afternoon and to thank the audience. I apologize to those whose questions were not asked. I'm sure you can email the speakers and they will happily respond uh, in writing. And I want to thank our uh, trusty staff, Or and Hadal, for their work. Of course, uh, Yoav uh, for uh, leading this entire enterprise uh, to everyone in the audience. And uh, hoping to see you soon, either Zoom or, you know, God willing, someday even in person. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.